This morning as we go into this third part called The Upgrade, this is entitled, Will You Take the Next Step? Ask your neighbor to your left and to your right, will you take the next step? Amen? Um, I tell you, I'm just excited as we were going through this and, and uh, just believing God for um, that every one of us in this house, uh, by the end of this series, will have an upgrade. Amen? And uh, we'll experience that upgrade. Uh, before I get into it, because I'm afraid I'm going to forget, I'm going to ask Miss Carol to come and join me for just a second. You're hearing a lot of testimonies today, but this one really hits close to our message today. And uh, can we just give Carol a welcome as she comes this morning? And uh, I've only known Carol for about a year. Huh? Yeah. About a year ago. Yeah. You came? When was City Fest? Oh, last August. Okay. That's when I started coming here. Okay. Praise God. And so, um, so since that time, uh, you went to the women's retreat just a few months ago, and you had heard about the upgrade before, but didn't really had not really experienced it or entered into it at that up to that point. And as you were there, you actually got the upgrade. I did get the upgrade. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and uh, but you just you were sharing with me before service something that that is a benefit and a blessing to the upgrade. And can you just tell us, explain to us as you explained to me today, just an experience you had with Holy Spirit this week? Well, kind of like Lynette was talking about, it's it's hard out there today and. Some days I really have a hard time staying focused on God and I get distracted with the enemy. And on Saturday morning, I woke up yesterday morning and I thought, I don't even want to do today. So after my husband went to work, I thought, okay, Carol, get your Bible out and, and start praying and read the, read the word. So I got my Bible out and I set it on my lap and I was sitting there and I thought, you know, Pastor Terry always says, ask the Lord what you want me to read, and I will read that. And so I started praying and worshiping and, and speaking in, in God's language, and I did that for probably 20 minutes, worshiping and just, just meditating on the Lord, and I heard John in my head, the book of John, and I thought, okay. And, and at first I thought, this is your imagination, but I just kept hearing it, so... I opened the book of John, and I said, okay, Lord, where do you want me to read in the book of John? And I just meditated on John for a few minutes, and then I heard a very loud 14. So I went in and read chapter 14, which actually talks about he will never leave us. He is always here. And it, it just was like, wow, because it was exactly what I needed to hear. And I knew, I know in my heart and in, in my whole heart that God told me, open Open John 14 and read it and trust me, and everything is going to be okay if you just trust me. So that was huge to me. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Miss Carol. Amen. Amen. Praise God. That's what Holy Spirit is here to do. He's here to remind us. He's here to teach us. He's here to make Jesus famous in our lives. And, um, and so as we go into the Word today... Go with me to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to read verses, verse, just verse 1. Hebrews 6, 1. And so like I said, the title of this word today is, Will You Take the Next Step? Will you take the next step? Uh, we need all three steps in our lives, and we'll, and we'll kind of outline them here in just a moment. But Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, the writer here, we don't know who the writer is exactly. We believe it's Paul, but could have been someone else as well. But, but just as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these words, we're going to receive them. Therefore, it says, leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ. In other words, when we become born again, there are certain basic things that, that are expected. Kind of like when you go, when you first, you know, uh, our little guy, Rowan, he's, he just graduated from preschool. Now he's going to go into kindergarten, and, uh, which means a full day. And so Sherry's really excited about that. And um, we're, not, we're, we're not to the homeschooling phase yet, you know, but uh, we're just covering him with the blood, right, when we send him off. And so, 
But, um, but there are things that you learn initially when you are born again. And, and it's, it's referred to as elementary, the basics, right? And so he says here, these are the basics. It says, let us go on to perfection. And of course, the ultimate goal is to know Jesus. The ultimate goal is to have a relationship with God. That's the ultimate goal. But there are things that he says are elementary that actually help set us up when it comes to our walk with God. It says, number one, not laying the found. Let me read that part again. Let us go into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. In other words, uh, in other words you're, when you're born again, you've already repented of your past. Repent means to turn around. You've already done that. That's considered elementary. That's the first step. And then he talks about in verse 2, and the doctrine of baptisms. And we're going to dig into this today, the doctrine of baptisms and of the laying on of hands and of resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgment. And so the writer here is saying, all of these things that, that are listed are the basics. But one of them is called here the doctrine of baptisms. And so I'm going to dig into that because there, little did you know that there are three baptisms. And we're going to break it down today. But when it comes to Holy Spirit, understand that he is here he is, as you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is God in the earth. The Father is on a throne. Jesus is at his right hand, the Bible says, with all authority in heaven above and in the earth and below the earth. Why does he have that authority? Because he's the one who paid the price. He's the one who went and died, for, took our sins. And when he was buried, those sins were buried. When he rose again, we identify with him and we are raised in newness of life. The old man is dead. There was a, I don't know if you knew this, but the day you accepted Christ, there was a funeral conducted for your old man and the old woman. Amen? And in other words, they, they held a, there was a proverbial ceremony and it says, well, Terry was a nice guy. He was a good man. He lived, a, he lived an all right life. But he has been, but the nail has been shut closed on that coffin, and according to the word of God, that dead man, that dead woman is never to be resurrected again. Amen? Amen? And so that's why, but, but in that, we are now dead to sin, but we are alive in Christ. What that means is that sin no longer has a stranglehold on your life. Sin no longer has dominance over your life. You have repented, you have recanted, you have put it to the cross of Jesus Christ. And so now you're a new person, you know? I'm sure when Carlos gave his heart to Jesus that he's probably ran into some old friends. And they're looking at Carlos and they say, you look like Carlos, you're handsome and sharp looking like Carlos, you walk like Carlos, but you are not the Carlos that we've always known, amen? You're a new man. You're a new, new, a new person. It's because you are alive and the life of Christ now lives in us. And that life is the, is the result of the Holy Spirit in us. Okay? He is Christ in us. He makes us alive. So we're dead to sin and we're alive to Christ. We can no longer say, the devil made me do it. But rather... We say, Christ in me, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Amen? So we no longer can use that excuse. So many people say, well, pastor, you know that old sin nature, you know that old, you know, that old sinful nature. We need to strike that from our vocabulary. We need to strike that from our way of talking, even our self-talk. We need to strike that type of language from the way we talk, not just to other people, but the way we talk about ourselves. Because even if you don't experience everything that you're reading in the Word, it doesn't mean that the work is not going on. Jesus promised the work that he has begun in you, he is faithful to complete it. 
Yes, you may be tempted, and yes, you might be discouraged, and yes, you might be uh, facing some, some, some strong temptations, but temptation is not the same as sin. Temptation is when the idea comes up, and at that moment, you have a choice. Am I going to indulge in that temptation, or am I going to walk away from it? Am I going to run to the temptation, or am I going to run to Jesus? And this is the thing about it is, is that because of his death, burial, and resurrection, the word says because he lives, we will live also. He, he's the one who broke sin's power. He has forgiven. You know, up until Jesus, everything was just covered. But when Jesus, the Lamb of God, as John says, who takes away the sins of the world, when he came along, he didn't just cover them for future judgment, but rather he took them away. And he buried them. The Bible says they are cast as far as the east is from the west into the deepest sea. And God has planted a sign over that ocean and is saying, no fishing allowed. When the enemy wants to come and fish for your old ways and your past, you need to tell him, hey, you're off limits now. There's no fishing in this territory. My old life is off limits. Amen. And even if you're not experiencing, and you're, again, don't mistake temptation for sin. Don't let the enemy say, see, you're still the same person you were. You still have the same struggles you had. Don't, don't, what is the devil? He's a liar. Tell your neighbor, the devil is a liar. He is the father of all lies. And so if he's telling you something, you know the opposite is true. If he's telling you you're worthless and, and what a waste, you know that you're actually valuable and precious in the sight of God. Amen? If he tells you that, you're, that, 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 that there's no hope and no future for you, you gotta know he's lying to you. You gotta know that God is saying, no, I have a hope and I have a future. I have a plan. I've already carved out and prepared you for good works. Works of righteousness. Amen? And so this is realized as we allow Holy Spirit to operate in our life. Jesus said, if I don't go away, I cannot send another one just like me. Who is the other one? Holy Spirit. Because Jesus in a physical form can't be everywhere at the same time. But he's everywhere in us through the Holy Spirit. Jesus lives in a glorified body, if you don't know. He's at the right hand of the Father. And the word says, and we will be like him. How many of you are looking forward to your glorified body? <laughs> Amen. No more worry for calories or, you know, get back to that 28 waste, you know, and get back to, you know, just, you'll never, you'll never think about it again, obviously. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more separation. But in the meantime, the goal is not just to get to heaven, but for heaven to get in us. Amen. And it happens through the Holy Spirit. In Revelation 3.20, um, you know, this is the image of Jesus standing in front of a door knocking he says, if you will, I'm stand, behold, I'm standing at the door knocking. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the church. He's not talking to the world. Oftentimes we use it as an example to, for unbelievers to understand that Christ wants to be given access. He wants to come in. But really, that, that verse is actually speaking to the church, us, me, and you. And he says, if you will open the door, I will come in and commune with you, have, in essence, dinner we will share things together and you with me and so it's but again this happens via the holy spirit amen god gave us a choice because he doesn't want us like you heard it was said last week clayton mentioned it again we're not robots here it can't be love if you can't choose it's not love if you can't choose and so we choose to pursue god we choose to pursue even Holy Spirit. He, Holy Spirit, wants an authentic relationship with us. Again, Holy Spirit's not an it. It's not a force. It's not just a power. But he is a person. He is the person of the Holy Spirit. How many love getting packages in the mail? You love getting some delivery. It's like Christmas every day. It's Christmas every day here at Zeal Church, but the thing is, is that it always has Alex Lopez's name on it. Every time I go to the mailbox, I see a box. I'm like, oh, there's a box. But it always has Alex Valle Lopez printed across the top of it. And, and 
Yeah, so he must be highly favored. That's all I got to say. <laughs> highly favored and blessed of the Lord, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but he'll probably, don't you edit that out, okay? It goes in the podcast. Anyhow, <laughs> so, but when it comes to packages, you know, you get the UPS, FedEx. What's another one? US, USPS, USPC, whatever. You know, you get, you get, you get all these packages. Um, but think about this. Think, re, think about how the Holy Spirit is literally delivering packages to you all the time. He's delivering gifts to you. And you, you, there's, different, there's different reactions to Holy Spirit giving gifts. Um, have you ever seen the UPS or the FedEx guy come in, come and deliver gifts? Sometimes you go out to meet them. Other times you're just like looking through the window. You know, you're not dressed for the day. And you don't want them to see that you're there. You know, so the Holy Spirit is giving gifts, but it's a matter of whether we are ready to receive them. You know? And so there's three kind of people. There's, number one, there's a door blocker. Every day the Holy Spirit is knocking at the door of our heart with gifts, knocking there saying, hey, what, can I come in? Hey, can I deliver you gifts? And we're just, we got the, got the deadbolt on. We got the door closed. Click, click, click all the way down. We're just peering through the window saying, no, I don't want you to come in. But Revelation 3.10 says, hey, I'm knocking. I'm knocking every day on your door. And if you will open your door, I want to give you yet more gifts. That's what the Holy Spirit is here to do. He, he's, he's trying to give us that upgrade. And then we have the door shutter. In other words, it's the person who opens the door, but in reality they're blocking. They just stand in the doorway. You know, they're just standing there leaning up against the doorpost saying, yeah, I see you. But they're not really even letting the, whole, letting the UPS guy or letting the delivery man, letting Holy Spirit to bring the gift in the house. You're not just hiding behind something. Now you're standing in wide open and you're saying, you know what? You still can't get in. You still can't come and receive or drop off this gift. And then the third one is the door opener. It's the one who is anticipating Holy Spirit to bring packages. Amen? to bring gifts. Every day when we wake up, you know, we don't, you know, every morning we wake up, we don't say, good Lord, it's morning, but rather we say, good morning, Lord. Good morning, Lord. What do you have for me today? What packages are being delivered today? What, what, what are you going to reveal to me today about Jesus? What are you going to reveal to me today about God the Father, God the Son? I love how the fact that God the Father defers to the Son. The Son defers to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit defers back. See, there is no competition in the Trinity. There is not, there is not one that's greater than another. They all, they all are God. When one shows up, they all show up. When one is doing a work, they're all doing the work. Amen? They're all bringing gifts, but Holy Spirit happens to be the one that delivers the package. He's the one saying, hey, this is God's will for your life. This is... This is what Jesus had intended for you to look like and sound like and walk like, like him. And so we see here that we as believers, you heard it in the first message, uh, the Holy Spirit is not just an option, but he is an essential. We need Holy Spirit. We need to take all the steps that God offers. We see in John chapter 16, what is the purpose? What is his role? This is one, asp one way of looking at it. It says, when he has come, he who? Holy Spirit. He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And verse 11, and of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. See, the Holy Spirit, it says he will convict, but really, why don't you put the word convince in there? It's he, it's he who is trying to not only convince the world, but he's also trying to convince us of God's goodness, us of God's will, us of God's way. Holy Spirit's purpose 
And even as Carol was giving her testimony, she talked about praying in the Spirit. It's when we're in the Spirit and praying in the Spirit that it's the Holy Spirit trying to convince us of certain things. He says here, convince the world of sin. What's the sin? The sin of unbelief. It's not just, you know, ultimately, unbelief is what will keep you out of heaven. Unbelief is not believing that Jesus is the Son of God and that he came and died and rose again and that he paid the full price for your sin and my sin and to give us eternal life. But it can also play havoc in the unbeliever. We got a lot of unbelieving believers in the family. We got unbelieving unbelievers, unbelieving believers, believing believers. We got all kinds of believers. But the sin that will cause you the most heartache is this, the sin of unbelief. I was reading through Hebrews recently with our Zoom call in the mornings. By the way, we're into the book of Revelations right now, and we're having a good time. You're missing an early morning party every day, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. You can go to our website and find the link there, but join us for 30 minutes. I don't care if you're getting ready on your way to work or at work. If, 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 you can, if you're playing music in the background, why don't you play this devotion? But we're into the book there. And where was I going with that? I get so happy about things and I get off trail. But uh, <laughs> Hebrews, Hebrews in there, this really blew my mind a couple months ago. Because the, the word says in Hebrews 4.12, it says, The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting asunder the, 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 the soul from the spirit, the marrow from the bone, even determining or even uh, examining the very motives of the heart. Now, the sword of the spirit is called, or the word of God is called the sword of the spirit. And as we read it, and so the context of chapter 4 is unbelief. In other words, that when you take in the word of God, when Holy Spirit is taking that word and highlighting things to you in that word, what is his ultimate goal? To convict us of unbelief. It's when we don't take God's word literally. When we don't take it uh, to our own heart. When we say, well, God, that's good for somebody else. How many have ever been in church service and, and you're thinking to yourself, man, I wish, I wish so-and-so was here. They needed to hear that word. Man, if they were here, boy, God would have just tanned their hide. They would have got what for. They would have, you know, they would be changed and transformed today. But how many of you know the word is for us? You know? The word is for me. It's for us individually. But what the word of God is going after is unbelief. It's where you don't trust God with what he says. It's where you don't trust God for the miracles. Trust God for the provision. Trust God for the open door. Trust God for salvation. The Holy Spirit here, the word says, is convicting the world of unbelief, convicting the world of sin. And so no one can say that Jesus is Lord, think about this, unless the Holy Spirit allows them. Because we need, when it comes to unbelief, uh, you have sin and you need a Savior. You know, ultimately, it's for our salvation, Secondly, he says, convince you that you are the righteousness of Christ. Convince you that you've been made worthy. So many people in the body of Christ, even though they've been born again, still do not feel worthy. They feel like because the old life wants to creep back up or temptations from the past or their old reputation wants to creep up, the enemy wants to lie to them. So often they do not feel worthy, but the Holy Spirit is here to convince us of righteousness in other words that when G it says it says of righteousness because i go to my father how did jesus go to his father he went through the cross he went through the resurrection and because he lives we now live and he's trying to convince us that yes you were once a sinner you know i don't like that bumper sticker that says you know uh we're all sinners but i'm a sinner saved by grace you are no longer a sinner, you are a saint. You are a saint. Peter didn't, didn't or no, Paul didn't keep calling everybody s sinners. He would say to the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in Corinth, to the saints uh, in Derby or Lystra, wherever he was going, he'd refer to them as saints. 
Again, you need to strike that from your vocabulary. You need to say, you know what? I'm no longer a sinner. I've been made holy. I've been made, I've been made new. I've been set free. You don't have to, as other religions call for it, that you have to perform 10 miracles to be considered a saint. You are a saint the day you accept Jesus into your heart. You are the, even God the Father, before Jesus performed one miracle, he said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He already began to honor him in that way. He honors you in that way. Amen. You may say, but pastor, I've never seen a miracle. Pastor, you know, I'm still, you know, God is still calling you a saint. Don't insult God by saying otherwise. Don't insult him because in essence you're trampling on the sacrifice of Jesus. In essence, when you go back and, you, and, you, and you've, you've believed the lies of the enemy and you're no good and you're not saved and it was nothing but, you know, it, what you felt was nothing. What you're doing according to the word of God is you're going back and you're just trampling. You're trampling on the goodness of God, trampling on what he has done for you. And so he's convincing us not only to come out of our unbelief, but also of our righteousness. It's not by performance, but it's by our position. You have positionally been made a son or daughter of God. Even when you mess up, he says, repent. He's just and faithful to forgive. The Holy Spirit convinces us of righteousness in our lifestyle. Again, the devil has no power over us. And then thirdly, he says here, he convinces us that the enemy has been defeated. In other words, the words in Hebrews there, it says of judgment because the ruler of the world is judged. He is fighting a losing battle. The enemy is dumb enough to think he can still be God, but he never will. He never has, he never will. And so the word tells us that the Holy Spirit convinces us of judgment because the enemy is already defeated. Don't let him convince you that he's got the upper hand. Don't let him convince you of something. This is the thing about Jesus is that when it comes to shame, and maybe you've heard this, this before, but when it comes to shame, shame, which is of the enemy, shame tells you who you're not, whereas Jesus tells you who you are. Amen? Amen? Shame tells you who you're not. Jesus and his blood and his sacrifice and his resurrection tells you who you are. And so when you get into that funk, you have the Monday morning blues, whatever you want to call it, that is not a thing in the kingdom of God. But rather, when you feel that, when you begin to feel that way, understand the enemy has been defeated. You don't have to listen to the lies. You don't have to listen to his deception but know that he is a defeated foe and like we used to always sing where is the devil he's under my feet amen he is under my feet and so we see here when it comes to baptisms the writer here is saying this is an elementary teaching in the in the in the faith but there are three baptisms i want to highlight today and most of you probably have taken one or two of these baptisms but there's all three that you want to participate in. Number one, it's the baptism in salvation. The baptism of salvation. Whether you were one-on-one -on -one at the workplace and someone talked about Jesus and led you to Christ and you accepted him in your heart, you may not have realized it, but you were baptized into salvation. You were baptized into the body of Christ. You are no longer a sinner, you are now a saint. Say that with me, I am a saint. I am a saint. I know the world has a whole different picture and it's a kind of a derogatory statement, but you can say of yourself, I'm a saint. I've been made holy. I've been set free. I'm no longer a sinner. Amen? We are saints in Christ. And so we see here the first thing we were baptized into was salvation. And the Holy Spirit was the one who did it. He baptized you into Jesus. 
1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body of Christ. Amen? And so in it, we have eternal fellowship with the Father in heaven and on earth. And so this baptism secures your future. You're not saved one day and not the next. You might feel like it. Some days you might feel it. You wake up and you think, man, I don't, I don't feel saved. But the word says here, the Holy Spirit baptized you into Christ. You were forgiven. You repented. And you are saved. Amen? And as long as you continue to pursuing Jesus, you have nothing to worry about. Doesn't matter what's going on. Doesn't matter what the world events are. Doesn't matter what's happening around you. Your eternity is secure in Christ as you pursue him. You know, don't make the mistake, you know, you got your, what do you call it, your Easter and your, and your Christmas Christians. People who show up just a couple times a year, they, they get that scratch itched. They're like, okay, I feel good, everything's good, and go back to the way they were living. When it comes to being born again, it is just the beginning. It's not the end all. When you are born again, that's just the start. That's just like the, a new day. Old things have passed away. Everything is now new. This is the beginning of your eternity within Christ. Amen? But don't make the mistake, and you might see others do this, and if necessary, have a talk and say, listen, salvation is just the first step. There's more to come. Amen? And so we are baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit. And then there's the second baptism. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. This is Jesus talking to the disciples. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I love baptism Sundays. We had one just a few weeks ago, right? It is that we don't, let me say it this way, we are not saved by water baptisms. We are, we've already been born again. We're already in the body of Christ. Water baptisms are simply a public display of a decision that we made to serve Jesus. You know? I, I heard this the other day. Baptism Sunday would be a good day to invite all your exes, all your old friends, you know, those who don't want to hang out. It's not that you have shrugged them off, but rather they're like, man, they don't, you don't talk about the things we like to talk about anymore. You don't tell the dirty jokes that we like to laugh at anymore. And you find that you as a believer now need to work even harder when it comes to being a witness to them. But what better way than to invite them to your baptism? To say, hey, I'm getting dunked in the tank on Sunday. Do you want to come and watch? And uh, come as you are. But really what it is is that it is a public display, a public testimony of the decision you made to serve Jesus. It is, it is our way of identifying. We, are, we already identified with him in the sense that we've repented of sin, but now we're saying, I identify with Christ. In the days of the Bible, um, it, you, it, was, it was black and white. You either identified as a believer in Jesus or you identified as a worshiper of other gods. And there were people that would go before uh, judges and magistrates and say, I worship whoever it is. And if you said anything but Nero, you could be thrown in jail. But there were these believers that said, my Lord is Jesus. And so when you do this, it's amazing. There's something in that physical act. I've heard it said this way. Physical action brings spiritual release, spiritual victory. When you, it's not, God is not looking for secret service Christians. He's not looking for undercover Christians. He's not looking for Christians that keep it to themselves. You know, there's this, there's this, this lie of the enemy, you know, that's my business. That's your business. No, it, when it comes to Jesus, it's all of our business. Because you want to let everybody know I identify with him. I no longer identify with my old life. I no longer identify with the world. I identify with Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Amen? And so that is the second baptism. 
It's a public thing. You go down as a sign into the water of, the, of being buried with Christ, and you come up as a sign of his resurrection. Again, because he lives, we live also. And how do we do that? You know, it, again, water baptism is not what saves you, but it's that act of faith. There's something that it that does in you. The more you talk about it, that's why when you hear me at the end of a service when we invite people to accept Jesus, and I say before you leave the room, go tell somebody. Because every time you tell somebody, it reaffirms Jesus in your life. It reaffirms that, yes, this decision is real. Yes, my experience is real. Yes, the love of God is real. And Holy Spirit in you begins to give you the words to say. He begins to give you the strength to say it. And then there's the third baptism. So we have baptism into Christ called salvation, baptism in water. The disciples were the one who did it back in those days. We do it today as disciples. And then thirdly, baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is where Jesus baptizes us into the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit draws you to a place of salvation. We as disciples, we baptize in water as a public sign that the old is gone and that we're now new. But then Jesus then baptizes us in the Holy Spirit and it's power for life. Say that with me, power for life. He told the disciples in Acts 1.8, he says, go wait for the promise of the Father and you shall receive power to become witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. It's for power. We're so good at taking the first couple steps, but he's like, hey, there's yet another step, and it's for power. This is the reason why people are struggling with even their Christian faith, because they're satisfied with two baptisms, but we need all three. When Peter got up and preached that day in Acts chapter 2, verse, I think it's around verse 37, 38, he says, when the crowd said to Peter, what, would he, what should we do to be saved? He said, repent for the remission of your sins, be baptized in the name of Jesus, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's part of the package. It's part of the upgrade. Jesus paid one price that included all the benefits. Amen? He didn't have to come back and take an extra measure, another step, or, or do something else. Everything he did was not only to save us, but to fill us with Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. To fill us with Holy Spirit and to make us part of the body of Christ, the church of the living God, to be his witnesses in all the earth. You know, you may say, but I'm not a pastor. I'm not a missionary. I'm not a, you know, you, let me say it this way. 98% of you in this room today are in the biggest mission field on planet earth. It's called the marketplace. It's called the marketplace. Every time you step in, out of your car and walk into that office building or into that warehouse or wherever you're going, you're stepping into the harvest. You're stepping into a, a, a population of people that, that, you heard me say this before, that are relying on you to be spirit-filled. They don't know it yet. They don't realize what's going on. But the world needs a spirit-filled church. Amen? The world needs a spirit-filled church. They're relying on you to be spirit-filled. They're relying on you to know Jesus Christ. They're relying on you to know what the Word says. They're relying on you to know when the, when the Holy Spirit says, speak and don't speak. Go this way or go that way. Amen? And so they, the world needs a spirit-filled body of Christ. Christ died for that purpose, not just to save us, but to fill us. The world needs it. All the Gospels talk about it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all say it this way. Matthew 3.11 3, says, He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Mark says, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Luke 3.16 says, He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John 1.33 says, He who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. All of the disciples, they were firm believers in the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so if Jesus had all three, then what makes us think we can do without it? 
if Jesus had all three, if he walked through every step, now remember, Jesus was sinless. He didn't have to repent of anything. He didn't have to say, God, forgive me. Father, forgive me for my sin. In fact, the Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin in order that he might pay the price for humanity. Amen? But Jesus came to the riverbank one day. John the baptizer, his cousin, his older cousin by six months, God was using him as a prophet. He was the first prophet in the New Testament. He was prophesying that there's one coming after me in whose shoelaces or sandal laces that I'm not worthy to untie, and he will be baptizing you. He says, I baptize you in water, but he's coming to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Fire to make us holy. Fire to make us clean, to, to keep us, I should say. That's why Sp Holy Spirit's called holy. We're not the ones producing the holiness. He is. We're simply saying yes to Holy Spirit. But Jesus, the word says, he got baptized in water. He walks up to John. He says, John, you got to baptize me. John says, brother, cousin, <laughs> cousin Jesus, I can't do that. He says, you must need baptize me. And the Bible says that he took Jesus and he baptized him as he had done thousands of others. He baptized him, and when he came up out of the water, the word says that the Father in heaven spoke with an audible voice and said, this is my beloved son. In him, I am well pleased. Again, Jesus had, not, had never performed one miracle. He didn't teach one class. He didn't preach one sermon. He didn't cast out one devil. And yet God the Father said, this is my son. I am pleased with him. That's what he says of you when you take the steps. That's what he says of you when you become born again. He's like, you know what? I am, I, this is my daughter. This, this is my daughter. This is my son. These are my kids. I am well pleased in them. And so we see in that picture that God the Father was there. Then we see the Son is there, and also God the Holy Spirit was there. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in the form, as the form of a dove. Dove is a picture, dove is a picture of peace, but he descended on him as a form of a dove on Jesus Christ. And so this is, and so then we see that after that, Jesus began to perform signs, wonders, and miracles. We see in the, in the life of the disciples that it increased, there was an immeasurable increase of the works of God in their lives. Ephesians tells it this way. Ephesians chapter 5, verse, verse 15 through 20, is so, so be careful how you live, not like those with no understanding, but live honorably with true wisdom, for we are living in evil times. How many can say we're living in evil times? Amen. Take full advantage, talking about this upgrade, talking about the Holy Spirit. Take full advantage of every day as you spend your life for his purpose. And do not live foolishly, for then you will have discernment to fully understand God's will. And verse 18, and do not, and don't get drunk with wine, which is rebellion. Instead, be filled. It literally means be inebriated continually with Holy Spirit. Worldly wine leads to rebellion. Holy Spirit, what does it say here? It leads to this, verse 19. And your hearts will overflow with a joyful song to the Lord. I love that about Holy Spirit. He gives us a new song. You know what? You don't, you don't just have to sing the songs you hear on K-Love or whatever you're listening to. But he will, the Holy Spirit will also give you a song to sing about your life, about what God has done in you. Keep speaking to each other with words of scriptures and singing the Psalms with praises and spontaneous songs. What are spontaneous songs? Songs sung in the Spirit, given by the Spirit. Always give thanks to the Father for every person he brings into your life in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so in this upgrade, and as the musicians are coming, in this upgrade, he wants to fill us to overflowing. You know, I got to think about this right before, during worship, actually. This image hit my mind because, you know, even coming into church today, 
I felt this tangible, how should I say it? I mean, we know Holy Spirit is always here. You know, as we keep Christ the center, as we pursue him, we know that he is present. We know that he is operating. But I have to say, today when I walk in the room, I have to say I felt just an increased tangible measure of the presence of God. Why is that? Why is that, you say? I think my mind, I had this image. How many of you know the old Western, or the old-fashioned water pumps? The kinds that you, you, when you walk up on it, you got to pump it. Is there a formal name for that? Just old-fashioned pump? <laughs> and I got to thinking about those old pumps uh, back in the olden days before technology. I mean, that was technology, obviously. But they would take a piece of leather and they would put that leather down the pump and they would start pumping for that water, that water that could not be seen, but they knew it was down there, you know? It's like salvation. We have been given access to the Holy Spirit, access to this well. The Bible says that out of your bellies shall flow rivers of living water. And in that old pump in those days, they would put that leather in the bottom as part of the device to draw the well out. What happened would be, would, would be that that, wet, that leather would get wet and it would swell. And, that, and it would swell to the size of the pipe coming up out of the well and create a suction and pull the water up out of the well until water came spewing out of the top of the well. That is a good picture of what it means to be filled and overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Every time you go to God's word, like Carol was talking about, or every time you go, whether you go to a house party or go to a service or just your private time with the Lord worshiping God, what are you doing? You're priming the pump. You're priming the pump. You're, 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 that, that leather, let's, that leather, let's equate it with us. It's beginning to swell it's beginning to uh, take, take shape. It's, it's drawing something from the deep. Even the Bible talks about how that the deep spirit of God cries out to the deep spirit of man and says, hey, I want to fill you. I want you to be overflowing. I want you to spill out. I want there, there is a deep, vast well that has an endless resource of water. And, you can, and, and this well will never run dry. I don't care if you live five years or 50 years or 100 years or 1,000 years. That well will never run dry. And every time you position yourself, whether it's answering the invitation to receive Holy Spirit or in your prayer time as you're worshiping God uh, in your home or on your drive time, what are you doing? You're priming. You, you may not see the evidence quite yet, but you know the water's there. You may not see the splash of water coming but yet the water is there. And it's a flow. And once it starts flowing, you don't want to stop it. Once it starts flowing, you just want to keep pumping that well. But in the meantime, you know, as you're pursuing the upgrade, my encouragement to you is don't give up. Don't stop. Maybe you've been trying for weeks. Maybe you've been trying for months. Maybe you've been priming that wealth even for years and you're saying, Lord, I know there's more. I know there's water down there. I know there's a vast resource. I've gotten a little trickle of it. I've gotten a taste of it. But I know that there is so much water that it's like a torrent river. It's like a river that is overflowing, a river that wants to push away all the debris, all the branches, all the moss, all the garbage. There is a flood behind this pump. There's a flood under this well. There is an artesian well under here of water flowing, and it's free of charge. It's free to me. It's free to the world. If we will just but position ourselves and say, Lord, prime my pump. I, want, I look at that leather as your heart. Again, that, that, that heart has started to swell. Why? Because you have Jesus in you via the Holy Spirit. And that, well, that, that leather is priming that leather is swelling as it is taking in the water, but there's more. There is, a, there is a resource that will never run dry. Amen? And so this morning, as you stand with me today,
You can ask yourself, Lord, what are you trying to tell me in this message? You can begin to say, Holy Spirit, Jesus paid for my upgrade. And Jesus, I want everything you have. I want everything. I see people who have breakthroughs in their lives. Let me say it this way. Breakthroughs don't just happen. You don't just stumble into a breakthrough. Now, that breakthrough, before that breakthrough comes, there was priming. There was praying. There was fasting. There was having a faith that cannot be denied. I remember at the early age when I was pursuing the upgrade, I remember I got to a point and can I say this way? My arm was getting worn out, (laughs) trying to prime that pump called Terry Hate. And yet, and there was a, and there was a point where I finally just quit. I just walked away from the pump. I'm like, you know what? I'm not even sure there's any water down there. I seriously doubted before I seriously believed. And I remember one day I was invited to go to a church service and having been priming that pump, having been praying, having been pursuing God, all of a sudden the water started to flow and the presence of God began to fill my heart in a way I had never known before. And can I say it this way? Water began to flood my heart, flood my soul. And water has been flowing ever since, thank God. Amen? Water has been flowing because it's life-giving water. And some of you have been priming the pump for a long time, and you're like, you know what? Maybe my pump doesn't have anything else. Maybe this is as good as it gets. I'm here to tell you, there is a well that will never run dry. There is so much water under that pump. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Just because you can't see it or feel it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. But we need to position ourselves and keep priming that pump. Keep saying, Lord, I want more. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you for for my public identification in Christ. But Lord, I know there's more. The thing is, we, we don't earn it or deserve it. But yet God says, hey, I have it for you. See, this is the thing about the three baptisms. Each one of them is an act of obedience. Think about it that way. Each one of them. You you were obedient to Christ when you first got saved. You said, Lord, I repent. Come into my heart. Then you took the next step of obedience. And sometimes the second, third step could happen in any order. But you took the second step and said, Lord, not only am am I saying it to you, but I'm going to say it to the world. That's yet another act of acquiescing saying, God, I am yours. But it's interesting how this third one is always where people stop short because it calls for such active obedience, such a sense of saying, God, Terry Hate gives up. I can't do this anymore. It's not, I can't generate this gift of God. It is a gift from God. You're the one who dispenses it freely and I want to receive it. I want to encourage you today. Just say, Lord, you know, because this is the thing too about this upgrade. It is not a mathematical equation that I could I could spell out to you and say, this is how it happens, or this is how you get there. But rather, it's simple, it's simple hunger and obedience, saying, God, I don't care if I made the fool. I don't care how long it takes, but I want to see that. I want to see my pump not just primed, but I want to see it overflowing with living water. Amen? And so if you're here this morning and you have yet to even step up to the pump because you don't know Jesus, he wants to come into your heart today. He wants to, he wants to save you today. The price has been paid. And if you're here this morning, I want to encourage you right now. If you will say, Pastor Terry, would you pray? Would you, I want to pray with you to receive Jesus in my heart. And as boldly as Jesus hung on the cross and gave his life's blood for all of us, and we're going to celebrate your salvation in just a moment, but as as boldly as Jesus did it, he did it in front of the whole world, would you raise a hand and say, that's me. I want to accept Jesus. I want this life's water. I want forgiveness. I I want to put away the old person 
Anyone in this house today, raise a hand boldly. You hear, you see, I'm not asking for people to close their eyes at this point, but to say, you know what? Yes to Jesus. Yes, I see Hector over here. Anyone else? You'll say yes to Jesus. Anyone else in the house? To say yes to Jesus. Would you pray this prayer with me? Jesus, thank you for paying the price for my sin. Thank you for walking in my shoes and bearing the weight of my sin. I ask you now, forgive me, wash me, come into my heart, make my heart your home. From this day forward, I call you friend, but I call you Lord, Savior of my soul. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Before you leave this house today, whether you're Hector right here that just did it or you're someone else, please tell somebody. Please tell somebody. A young lady right here in the front row last week raised her hand. I talked to her after the service. I said, you know, I hear that this was your first time ever coming to church. She said, yes, I've never been to a church service in my life. And she accepted Jesus for the first time. And she's been, she's been calling her family and calling her friends and saying, what do I do next? What comes next? I am so, I'm free. What, what can I expect next? And of course, the next is what? The upgrade. Amen? To just enjoy all of God's blessings. And so if you will this morning, just put out your hand like you're receiving a gift. I know we're taking time here, but again, I just, God's presence is so tangible in this house this morning. And we are all right now priming that pump. And we're saying, Holy Spirit, fill me. Fill me to overflowing. My heart is swelling with anticipation. My heart is swelling with desperation. I want, I want everything you have, Jesus all that you have to offer, all that you have to pay for in Jesus' name. And so, Lord, right now, as we are here in this house together worshiping, Lord, we're saying to you, Lord, I want more. I know there's more. Holy Spirit, come. You're already in me demonstrating Jesus, but there is yet more. There is an endless fountain of life, an endless fountain of living water that you want to not just reside and deposit in me, but you want me to be immersed. John the Baptist said, there's one coming, his name is Jesus, that he, while he baptized in water, Jesus will baptize in the Holy Spirit, immerse us in Holy Spirit. Jesus, even now, immerse every one of us in your Holy Spirit, we pray. In your Holy Spirit, we pray. We are hungry, we are thirsty, we are yearning for more, the more in the mighty name. We don't earn it or deserve it, but yet it's a gift. It's offered to us, and we're hungry. The Bible says that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Lord, we hunger after you. We thirst after you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Some of you now are probably just feeling something coming up on the inside. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the water coming from below as you're priming your well, as you're taking the time right now to say, Holy Spirit, come, fill me. Jesus, fill me in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray today throughout this day that there would be an increasing measure of Holy Spirit, not just here in this room, but Lord, as we go about our, our day today and go about our week this week, Lord, God, that there would be an ever-increasing hunger from this day forward. We are committed to pump the well. We're committed to prime the well. We're committed to prayer. We're committing ourselves to time spent in your presence. We're committed to worshiping you, dear God. We're committing to thirsting after you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. As we worship, as we worship, just ask the Lord, Lord, I want more. Fill me. Fill me. Fill me in Jesus' name.